Hello, Northeastern. It's great. To, hi, it's great to see you. Welcome to our kickoff of our Meet the Author series. It's also our 20th anniversary year for Snow Library, so it's a pretty exciting time. I just love the Meet the Author series. It's such a great format for people to come together and discuss ideas and explore issues and learn something new. So I wanted to challenge each one of you today to talk to each other afterward as you're munching on some good food or go home and talk to your roommates or call your parents and actually talk about something that you found interesting from today's talk. That's the whole point of the Meet the Author series. I want to thank the members of the Library's Programming and Communications Committee and recognize Jordan Hellman. Jordan, can you stand up wherever you are and wave your hand? Jordan is our wonderful co-op, marketing and events co-op, and she's learning the ropes, and she's coordinating this year's series. We're very fortunate to have her, and she has secured co-sponsors for every single one of our Meet the Author series this year. Thank you, Jordan, and our wonderful team. The bookstore is one of our really wonderful, great co-sponsors. They've been faithful supporters of this program throughout, so please help to support them and the author by buying a book afterward. And I want to say a little shout out to Steve Morris. Thank you so much for Steve Morrison for um, bringing this wonderful top-notch author to our attention. The Libraries Meet the Author series, as you know, um, is, is, uh, brings together people to um, encourage dialogue on significant and contemporary questions and bring together the Northeastern community to, to discuss these issues. John Siegfried is a professor of economics at Vanderbilt University and chief administrative officer of the American Economic Association. He received his BS in economics from Rensselaer Polytech Institute and his MA in economics from Pennsylvania State University. His PhD he received in economics from the University of Wisconsin. He has taught on the faculty of Vanderbilt since 1972. Welcome, John Siegfried. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, this is the title of the book. I'm actually the editor, not the author. Uh, there are authors of 12 chapters, although I think my job was harder than theirs, which was to get them to do it. Uh, and these are all very, very busy people because many of them uh, are quite involved in public policy and. Uh, were involved in the policies uh, that are discussed in the book. That also means uh, they have another characteristic in common. They are old because you don't get to be involved in policies when you're in your 20s. And uh, the policies that are talked about in the book uh, range uh, from the, uh, I guess, the mid-1960s through, I believe, the most recent one is 2006. Uh, that's a copy of the cover of the book. and. There, I'd like to uh, uh, point out two things there. Well, let's, uh, first of all, does anybody know what the picture is? Can you figure it out? I couldn't when I first got it. I looked at it. I turned it upside down. Uh, you, you know what it is? What, it, what is it? A chicken in every pot. Yeah, those are rubber chickens. There's somebody in my office that actually has a rubber chicken, which occasionally appears on the top of my door uh, the day after I do something stupid. Uh, to remind me not to do that again. Uh, where does chicken in every pot come from? Uh, let me see if any of the young people know where chicken in every pot comes from. No? You've heard, but you've heard it. I, um, okay. Yeah. Well, it was actually by Hoover. It was his campaign slogan. Or it was close to his campaign slogan. It actually wasn't his campaign slogan. It's not chicken in every pot. This is a prosperous country. We want to grow a lot. So not a chicken in every pot, but two chickens in every pot was actually what uh, his uh, slogan was. And uh, to be sure, while you're thinking about chicken in every pot, so what are we all going to go back uh, to lower middle class here or something? Uh, it, in the period in the 1920s, chicken was a relatively expensive uh, meal. So to put it in, in contemporary terms, it would be two lobsters, I guess, in every pot. Yeah. Now the title is Better Living Through Economics. 
Uh, anybody under age 40 uh, ever hear of better living through something else? <laughs> yes, uh, better living through chemistry is where it came from. And uh, where did that come from? Better living through chemistry. Who would say that? Any idea? It's on television an awful lot in the 1950s and the 1960s. No, it was not Dow. No, you're close. <laughs> I usually get a General Electric. Uh, their slogan was, progress is our most important product. This one was DuPont, uh, better living through chemistry. And uh, the idea behind the book is to try to uh, document some cases where uh, economic research uh, led to changes in public policy, which, when I organized the book, uh, I thought I could get 80% of the U.S. Senate to vote were a good thing. Now, I do believe that today I couldn't get 80% of the U.S. Senate to vote in agreement that I'm standing in front of you in a room in Snell Library, or that it's daylight outside. So my standard of 80% vote I'm going to have to give up. And in particular, the first one of these, which is cap and trade, I certainly couldn't get 80% to vote for. But if they understood what cap and trade means to economists who don't give a hoot about cap but care only about trade, then I think we still perhaps could get 80%. Uh, uh, indeed, it's mostly the Republican Party that opposes cap and trade because they oppose the cap. If you told them they had to have the cap, then I would think if you're a proponent of free markets, you'd like the trade part instead of having some bureaucratic administrator decide who's going to cut back on uh, on the uh, effluence to meet the ambient standard, which is the cap. So I guess I'm going to have to keep running back here to turn the pages of this thing. Uh, that's a slide that kind of talks about why economists feel that they aren't appreciated. Uh, we get blamed for everything that goes wrong uh, and get credit for almost nothing that goes right. Uh, my friends are saying we're having horrible times right now, and I'm saying, what are you talking about? The growth rate is slightly above zero. This is a great thing. It all depends on your expectations. And it all depends what you think sort of the status quo should, should be. And uh, to be sure, economists do get blamed uh, for a lot of things. Uh, courses on the history of science, uh, at least at Vanderbilt, don't include anything about economics, a lot about engineering, about medicine in particular, uh, and about uh, science. No one gets enormously wealthy in economics over these uh, ideas, such as uh, Bill Gates, uh, where you can say, wow, he really must have made a contribution because we have the evidence, it's the pile of money that he has accumulated. Uh, and so it's uh, kind of natural that, uh, uh, that there's a gap here in terms of uh, economists uh, getting credit for some of our contributions. These are the 12 chapters uh, in the book. And those are the authors, many of them, who were very much involved in the changes that took place. Every time I present this, I pick a different set. And as of this moment, I still don't know which ones I'm going to pick, because I just go through and pick ones that uh, sort of occur uh, uh, on the spur of the moment uh, uh, to me. I'll probably be able to talk about maybe two or three of them uh, here. Uh, this is the almost made it list. Uh, some others uh, where economists have made a contribution. Peak load pricing, which actually goes back two centuries, uh, is probably uh, uh, one of the strongest cases. And in fact, uh, I asked somebody to write a chapter on that. That's the only person that turned me down. Uh, and the grounds uh, there was I'm just so tired of writing chapters about peak load pricing because the person that I wrote, which uh, some of the people sitting in the front row probably have already figured out who it is, but I don't want to embarrass him because he turned me down, uh, has written lots of chapters about peak load uh, pricing. Uh, the do not call list is another good example of, of something more recent where the Federal Trade Commission staff had a lot to do with the implementation of a do not call you and interrupt your dinner list, but we don't have a do not mail you list. Uh, differences? Well, the incremental cost of getting rid of the advertiser is lower for a do not mail list. At least at our house, all the mail gets piled up on the kitchen counter until one of us decides to go through it. That's usually me and throw the stuff out before even opening it along with my credit cards and other stuff. 
uh, and that's very easy to do, whereas uh, uh, if you get called, it's the caller's choice as to the time, not your choice as to the time. And so you have relative differences in costs. We want to use the basic idea behind it. Well, let me move on. And uh, oh, I'm so tired of doing emissions tra trading. Let me skip that one today. <laughs> Uh, well, let me try this one, Deferred Acceptance Algorithms. This one's usually of interest, particularly to a group uh, moving into their 20s and early 30s, because this all started uh, with the market for marriage, which is a deferred acceptance algorithm. Uh, Al Roth and his colleagues, uh, not too far from here at Harvard, uh, have done a lot of these matching uh, projects where they develop alternative ways to match people on two sides of a market. The markets they work on have one important difference than the market for corn or furniture, chairs, or anything else that you usually have as an example in an economics class. In these markets, the item to be purchased can say no. That is, you have to get an agreement not only on the one side of the market to match up, but also on the other side. So for example, uh, uh, the, the students in here uh, applied to universities. Some of them said yes, some of them said no. And the ones that said no, uh, you don't have a match and you can't, uh, you end up uh, going to Northeastern rather than uh, whatever the alternative would have been. Uh, that's quite an important difference uh, in, in markets. Corn doesn't say no when you go and say, I want to buy a bushel of corn. And it turns out that really makes a big difference. So the kind of markets that these people have looked at, more recently they actually haven't done very much with the marriage market, but that's where the basic algorithms, the basic mathematical models uh, underlying this came from. Uh, but they've looked at school admissions. It's actually not college admissions that they've been worrying about, uh, but rather high school admissions in New York and Boston, now implemented, I think, five years now in Boston. Uh, and so probably none of you, since, since this is uh, kind of going into ninth grade, none of you would have used the new algorithm because I'm going to presume, I guess it could be a freshman here maybe that uh, uh, did use it, but no, I think you would still be a year uh, too late. Uh, so it's uh, colleges and where they have done a lot of their original work is in the placement of medical doctors into residencies, into different hospitals. Uh, let me just give you a rough idea of how this works. Say, uh, I'll use the school method. Uh, been before seven years ago in New York City, uh, eighth graders would sit down at the kitchen table with their parents uh, and say, well, where would you like to go to school? Well, what's the best school? Stuyvesant, maybe, in uh, New York, the pu best public school. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you're a great student. You want to go, yeah, except you got all A's, but well, there's that one B in high school economics. Uh, I wonder, do you think you can get into Stuyvesant with one B and all the rest A's? Maybe. Maybe not. Hmm. Well, let's see. If we applied for Stuyvesant and didn't get in, what would happen? Well, they take all the people who apply for Stuyvesant uh, uh, and send them to Stuyvesant and they get to pick. If there's still some empty spaces, uh, well, they would take the ones with the top grades, excuse me, and send them there. If there's still some spaces, then they go down a notch and take the next batch and send them there and so on. Well, now it's possible that the first batch will just fill the place up. Or it is possible also that Stuyvesant will reject. Remember, this is a model sort of like the marriage market. And in, in our culture, the male makes the offer uh, and the female holds the offers looking for a better offer. My wife took a year and a half to answer me. Uh, so she must have read uh, uh, this literature. Uh, she's actually an accountant, not an economist. Uh, uh, she claimed she did it for a different reason, that my behavior was different during that period. And she actually wanted to know if we could go back uh, to that uh, state. Uh, so you hold the offer uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and then look around for better offers. and. Uh, if no better offers come along, and the one who made the offer is acceptable, you have a match. It's called a stable match, actually. Now, we have divorce because new information often arises that you didn't have originally. 
uh, when the decision was made, either about the individual or about what other options are. Those are called affairs. Uh, they, they come along during, uh, uh, after the marriage. So what happened with the high schools then was uh, Stuyvesant would take its pick, of, and the top schools were getting oversubscribed. So it would take its pick um, from among the best students, and then what would they do with the rest? They'd put them in a pile. Okay? And then we go to, uh, what, Brooklyn Tech or Bronx uh, Science or something like that. Uh, and they would, that would kind of be the next tier of very good high schools in New York, and they would see who applied to them uh, and uh, then if they filled up, they'd take all the rest and put them in a pile. And at the end, they took the pile, they shuffled them up, and allocated them, allocated them I think, on the basis of uh, location. So you'd go to the closest public school number such and such uh, uh, for high school. Now, a lot of those schools, you needed to have training in firearms in order to attend them. And so uh, parents and their kids sitting there at that kitchen table would think very carefully about what would happen if we didn't get into our first choice. Indeed, my guess is many of you did this when you were applying to colleges. There's one difference, uh, usually in the high school choice, uh, there's a limit to the number of schools you're allowed to, to put on your list. And colleges, if you have enough money, you can apply to 1,400 of them, uh, 14, yeah, 100 of them, I guess. Never heard of anybody doing that. But a lot of times, uh, e even with colleges, uh, you may apply to what guidance counselors like to call a stretch school, and then you apply to a bunch that you think you can get into, but it's uh, going to be a close call, and then you apply to your safety school. Of course, I advise my son on the safety school. That's one of the two he didn't get into. Uh, so much for dad's advice on what a safety uh, school is, although he should have put the right school's name in the essay that he wrote. <laughs> this is a problem. Uh, literally, he did that. This is a problem he put Vassar in the application to Bates. Uh, and I told him Bates wouldn't be so, so small-minded as to turn him down. They did. Uh, and he got into better places than that. Yeah. So th that's the way it works. Uh, because uh, parents were scared, because maybe you're scared if you just apply to the Ivy League, uh, a lot of times what they would do is downgrade their choices. A lot of economics departments in hiring do that. At Vanderbilt or at Pittsburgh, where Al Roth w once was, uh, we would interview 25 new PhDs in economics. When we do that, we rank order them, take the five, set them aside. We're not going to use the top five. We'll never get them. They're going to go to Stanford, Chicago, or Harvard. So why should we make an offer, have them hold it, and then they turn us down, and by the time then we go back in the market, uh, there's very little left. And so we try to aim at what we think we can get. Well, this is the problem because what's going on then is that the parents and the student are not telling the truth in their rank order. They're trying to strategize uh, the system. And what uh, Roth and his colleagues have done in New York and um, Boston, they're now doing it in San Francisco, is to write an algorithm. Th they work for the school system. I should point this out. Roth has a classic article of years ago, 1982, uh, that showed there is no stable matching mechanism that makes stating the truth the best for both sides. So, but he's working for one side, he's working for the schools, and they can write an algorithm that makes telling the truth the best thing for the students and their parents. It roughly uh, works like the old one on the first round, but then after, uh, uh, Stuyvesant has picked its students. Then there's a second round, or indeed you can think of it as after the woman has picked her favorite uh, male out of high school, then she goes off to college and says, oh, what a new, new batch here. Uh, maybe there's something better. And just like in the marriage market, yes, my high school uh, girlfriend dumped me right after I went to college, uh, and found something better, uh, and then you could be replaced. And so when the second round comes around, when the people with all A's and just one B start to get allocated, if Stuyvesant looks at one of those and says, oh, this looks like a more creative student, let's say, uh, or has some other attribute, they can replace one of the ones from the first round with the second round. Well, this process keeps on going. A computer does this. People don't uh, do this. It would be uh, uh, very difficult to do it. Keeps on going until uh, they, in fact, uh, have a match uh, that the school system
could not find another set, another, another uh, uh, hierarchy, cascade, I guess would be the right word, uh, that it pre prefers. Uh, and there is no incentive, again, no incentive for the students and their parents to man try to manipulate the, the uh, system. They have done the same thing, slightly different, uh, with, uh, <clears throat> well, what's on the picture up there? <clears throat> Anybody know what those are? They're what? Well, that, 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 that's the second thing, but what are they first? People, and uh, dressed like medical. like medical students, that's what they are. And then what's strange about the picture? Four girls and one boy. Uh, if you go back to 1975, what would the picture look like? Five, no, five men, not, not four and one. <laughs> it would be five, uh, five and zero. Uh, and so what's happened since the 1980s, uh, there's more and more women entering medical school. I think they just tipped over to the majority in medical school. They've been the majority in law school for a while. Uh, and uh, 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 my wife watches these shows like, I keep calling it eBay. It's not that, but e ER, thank you, uh, ER. Uh, and there's another one, Gray's Anatomy, I think it is. And I, I don't like these, but I walk by, and every time I look at the television screen, there's... Uh, 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 two people in the supply room and they're not getting supplies, or at least not getting medical supplies. Uh, they're doing something else. In, the, in any, any case, 10% uh, of new medical school classes come out married to each other. 5% male, 5% female. That's a pretty sizable fraction. And to avoid the problem, suppose my wife comes out tops in the class. She could get into Mass General. Let's just say I had a good time in med school. Um, I'm the bottom of the class. Uh, but uh, we decide we want to be at the same location. Remember, these are people that just got married. Maybe 20 years later, they'd prefer to live in different cities, but not, probably not in the first couple of years. And so now we want to live in the same city, so what do we do? Well, usually the top one compromises a whole lot uh, uh, to try to get a, a location where you're sure both of you will get selected. Indeed, you might both go down from what you could otherwise do. Uh, and now, without trying to describe the algorithm, they have again, set up an algorithm where it actually searches over pairs. It puts pairs together and looks for spots. And again, there is no incentive for the med students to uh, not tell the truth, to, to kind of say, I want, let's say, Nashville General Hospital. You really don't want Nashville General Hospital. Uh, but that would be, you could for sure get resident, both get residencies uh, there. So that's what uh, uh, they have done. Uh, they've been doing a lot of this over the last uh, 15, 20 years, I guess. Uh, and uh, uh, have led to lots of students being in the best school that will have them in the same way that the, uh, many men would find the best woman that would have them. That's the idea of the deferred uh, acceptance uh, algorithm. Uh, just one last word to give you another, some more intuitive feel for it. The worst area in medicine for residencies uh, in, in trying to get one is uh, dermatology. Uh, all physicians, not all physicians, uh, 15 to 20 percent want to be dermatologists. Two to three percent are the number of spots open. They want to be dermatologists because you don't get very many phone calls in the middle of the night. You're paid very well. You don't see dying children. You know, pediatric oncology is not a real popular one. Uh, so it, this is an area where this is a nice doctor a job. 15 to 18 percent sign up for dermatology residencies. Two to three percent are dermatology residencies. Suppose the top 20 percent of the class all says, I'm going for a dermatology residency. Well, you almost have maybe 16 to 17 percent of the top of the class now that gets booted out, and if you did it the old fashioned way, into a pool that just gets randomly assigned. This is really bad news uh, because these are the, in the top quintile of the uh, graduating MDs. So let me move on to a, uh, uh, to a different one. Uh, let's do airlines. I like airlines. Uh, airline regulation started in 1938, I believe it was, when the Civil Aeronautic Board was formed. And its goal was to assure the financial health and stability of the airline industry. And it did that. Its goal was not to assure competition in the industry. Why did we do this? Well, there's an argument, usually called an infant industry argument, that when an industry is starting out, uh, you want to protect it from predation, I guess from railroads uh, at the time. 
Uh, they need a lot of capital to get started. We help them in another way there by the public provision, often owned by municipalities, uh, of airports so that the airlines themselves didn't have to build their own airports in the way that uh, trucking companies, well, or, or railroads have built their own, own terminals. By the 1970s, the question, uh, well, uh, back up. By the 1970s, we've had regulation for, what, 32 years, uh, or 32 plus years, and there have been no new airlines started. In that period, there were a lot of them that fell by the wayside. I, as I recall, by about in the mid-70s, we were down to about a dozen to 14 or something like that. There's some uh, Pan Am, National, Eastern that existed then, Braniff, that don't exist uh, now anymore. We're down to what? six or seven of the old legacy carriers, but we have some new entrants. Uh, and those are the ones that a lot of the students fly, JetBlue and Southwest and so on, uh, because their airfares are lower. So the question came, uh, how long is an infant an infant? And uh, the same question you have and what causes a lot of conflict with many of your parents, uh, which is uh, when are you no longer an infant or when are you no longer a kid? Or to put it more bluntly, when do you get to decide what, to do, what you're doing with your life and what, what you're spending and so on? And uh, when do your parents get to stop doing that? That's a lot of what the conflict is uh, uh, between uh, people of high school and college age uh, and their parents. Same thing true with airlines. So question arose, could this industry operate like other industries where if you and I wanted to start a new industry, or I guess the guy's name was Kelleher, uh, I started a new firm, excuse me, Kelleher was the uh, founder of Southwest Airlines. If we wanted to start a new uh, firm, could we do that? Could we get into the business? Now Kelleher and uh, Pacific Southwest Airlines did start new airlines, even though you couldn't enter if you crossed a state border. Then you would be interstate commerce, and those, uh, uh, the, the Interstate uh, Commerce Act uh, grants the federal government the right to control uh, uh, interstate commerce, and they took that and through the Civil Aeronautics Board prevented any entry uh, of new airlines. They also prevented entry into routes. You had to get permission to enter a route, but, and here's the key, they did not prevent uh, uh, any expansion of service on a route. So once you had a route, uh, you could fly as many flights as uh, you wanted. So here is the question. Uh, would competition lead to better service at lower prices or better service at the same price or the same service at lower prices uh, or it's possible you have both of them for uh, for the customers which there's two types uh, here and it's important that we recognize the second type both uh, um, passengers and cargo uh, a literature in the 1960s uh, Dick Caves uh, was one of a set of about a dozen students of, of Ed Mason's at Harvard, and he set out to have each one write a, an industry case study. There was one on aluminum, there was one on tin, uh, and there was one on airlines. Uh, Caves is uh, just retired from Harvard, uh, still writing. Uh, he wrote his, uh, this uh, I think was his thesis, actually, uh, and it was turned into a book, and uh, he found one very important thing about airlines that undermined the infant industry argument. Uh, another reason to regulate, other than the industry just starting out, is that there's huge scale economies. And that, for example, water distribution. We don't want two water companies in Boston. One has the roads all dug up all by itself. Uh, what would the second one do? And the, the pipes would just go side by side. If you want to get more water to the other end, just increase the pressure and push the water through the single pipe uh, faster. Uh, or have the uh, water company put in larger diameter pipes uh, to begin with instead of having two. Philadelphia at one time had two telephone companies. Uh, and if you had uh, two telephone companies back in the old uh, days when the telephone used to be connected by a wire to the wall to a unit and then the, by another wire, you would actually have to have both telephones. So you couldn't call a Verizon from a, a Sprint and so on. Uh, so you, you, and since you didn't know what phone to other people would have, you had to have uh, both uh, phones and they were just competing as two independent, uh, uh, completely independent, and I mean physically as well as uh, uh, financially uh, companies. Well, Caves, it, 
it's tempting to think of airlines as having huge scale economies because if you put one person on an airplane, the average cost is the cost of the airplane, the flight crew, and the fuel. If you put 100 people on the plane, the average cost is that same thing divided by 100. If you put 200 people on, the same thing divided by 200. So the more people you have, the lower is the cost. We don't have a blackboard here, but I'll do it with my hand. The average cost curve keeps going down as the passengers go up. And I often, uh, and the marginal cost of one more passenger is very low. Uh, so I often tell my students at Thanksgiving to go out to the airport and negotiate with them. Tell them I shouldn't be charging you more than marginal cost. That's what we teach in economics because uh, that then reflects the opportunity cost of the resources. And for all I know, that's probably $10, $20 uh, per passenger, a little more fuel, probably not much anything else. However, just be careful that the uh, person at the ticket counter doesn't look back and you say, that's fine, sir, we will be charging you marginal cost. You're bad luck, the plane just filled up and we're wheeling a new one out. And you're picking up the tab because the marginal cost to the first passenger of the next plane actually is the whole doggone plane. Okay. And, and so you may change your mind then about the uh, uh, value of, in this case, long run marginal cost pricing. Well, while for an individual airplane, the average cost will decline as passengers go up, when you w roll out the second plane, you're back to the top of the curve again for the second one, and it will go down again, and then the third one, and in fact, it looks like scallops, or like waves. Uh, and what Caves discovered is that across an airline system, not an airplane, that indeed there is not a very much of a reduction in cost as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that the average cost curve is relatively flat and this eliminates the justification that we use for utility distribution, electricity, uh, not, not the generation of it, but the distribution of it. Electricity, gas, pipelines, uh, water, and so on, uh, to have a single uh, company uh, supplying it. And if you have a single company supplying, uh, if I can remind you, everybody's had one economics course maybe. The average cost is going down, where is marginal relative to average? It's a multiple choice question on my 101 final. I give you above, same, below, can't tell, nowhere. Below it, it has to be below it because it's pulling the average down. Okay, so if marginal is below average, Marginal is below average. For efficiency, we want pricing equal to, what do you guys teach them here? Pricing equal to what? For efficiency. Marginal cost. So if price equals marginal cost, marginal cost is below average cost, how does price compare to average cost? Well, it's below it. Okay, who wants to get into this business? If the average price is below the average cost, you're going to lose money. And you're not going to make it up on volume because th this is the volume you're operating at. So if you have an industry like this, uh, like public utilities, what do we usually do is regulate them. And then we either compromise on the efficiency goal, raise the price a little bit, or we allow some price discrimination so they get extra revenues from the customers that are desperate for the product. Let's charge triple for electricity for kidney dialysis patients or something. That would be really mean. Uh, but we, people with an inelastic demand usually end up paying a higher price. The second book, uh, two books, uh, Levine and Jordan, uh, looked at PSA. Uh, that was a carrier wholly within the state of California, flew between San Francisco and LA and San Diego. Uh, San Francisco to LA is either the largest passenger frequency market or very close to it. Uh, it's, it's, it's right up there at the top. And so they had a very simple route system, back and forth, back and forth. In fact, you used to get on. You didn't have a ticket ahead of time. It was like getting on a bus. No, it was uh, worse. It was more like getting on a train where you could pay on the train. Usually on a bus, you have to pay when you're actually entering. But you'd get on, and they'd come around during the flight and collect the money. Uh, and you'll see in a moment what the fares would be. Would be. Uh, and then the third and the last one I want to mention is a book by George Douglas and uh, Jim Miller, uh, 1974. I think the nicest regulation book I've ever seen uh, that ex explained what the real problem with airline regulation is and it tried to make the 
story relatively short, uh, the carriers on a route were allowed legally to fix the prices, uh, and then the Civil Aeronautics Board would enforce them. So if you cut prices after they were fixed, uh, this was against federal law. Uh, so they, this was great. They didn't even have to worry about how they're going to keep the cartel together. They had the feds uh, ready to kick your door down with their guns out uh, uh, if you were to cut the price. So let's suppose, uh, let me take a, in 1976, I was working at the Council of Economic Advisors when this stuff was all going on. Uh, halfway through the year, our house in Tennessee was empty. Uh, I'd go to work at 6 in the morning. I'd come home at midnight. And after a while, my wife said, this is stupid. I'm moving back to Tennessee. And she did. And so for six months, I flew along with our congressmen and senators uh, on the first flight up on Monday and the last flight back on Fridays. Uh, two carriers, Braniff, now deceased, uh, and American Airlines. Uh, but let's just take this route. Uh, suppose uh, you're not making any money. Let's have this be average cost, horizontal, flat. If average is constant, it is equal to marginal cost. This is like if a batter, if, a ba if, if somebody on the Red Sox is batting 250 and went one for four last night, that's 250, uh, what happens to the, what's their new batting average? 250. So if the marginal 250 last night is the same as the average, it stays exactly the same. Everybody understands this with batting averages. If you change it to costs, you all just lose your mind and can't figure it out. Uh, but it's exactly the same idea. So let's suppose we have uh, constant marginal average cost. Price right down there, you're earning zero. So Braniff and American get together and say, let's raise the price up here. Oh, good. Now we're making a margin. Oh, we need more passengers. How can we get more passengers on this route? Cut the price. Oops. Nope. The feds kick down the door and shoot us then. Don't, can't do that. So how do we get more passengers? A little louder. You can't discount. If you discount, uh, you, you break the law. You can't cut the price. Better service. So what would be better service? Um, Ah, well, that, hold that one. That's the second one I want to come to. First, uh, they try you know, nicer meals. Uh, most of the young people don't realize this, but there used to be meals served on airplanes uh, in years back. And actually, in the 50s and 60s, uh, they even had these uh, uh, competitions in the, in the meals. They got lavish. There were lobster tail uh, dinners. Uh, fly on our airline, get a lobster tail dinner. Uh, then they reached an agreement, you can only serve a sandwich. Well, at everybody's site tries to cheat, they'd put three lobster tails between two pieces of bread and call it a sandwich. Uh, and this is always this is a problem. And, but did this raise cost? So what happens is, trying to attract customers, costs go up. Oops, now we're stuck again. We're not making money. So we get together. Let's raise the price again. And what happens? Same thing. But then eventually, <clears throat> what really does attract people, was it back here? The, more, more, flights. more flights. Because <clears throat> leaving... Uh, Nashville might have been at 8 a.m., noon, and 4 p.m., and I couldn't make the 8 a.m., but I wanted to be there uh, early afternoon, so 10 o'clock would be just uh, great for me. So if one of the two carriers put a 10 o'clock flight in, I'd switch if that wasn't the carrier I was normally flying on. Well, of course, what would the other one do then? 10 o'clock flight, uh, right? Or maybe slightly before or after if they have an estimate that the demand is not symmetrical exactly around 10 o'clock for their favorite departure time. If they think it's tilted a little one way or a little bit the other way. Well, now what happens to cost? They really go up because you've got to buy another airplane and a crew and the fuel. Oh, but you get a few more customers, too, because some people will look and say, oh, at 10 o'clock, I can actually do what I needed to do in Nashville in the morning, feed the dog, and then still leave and get to my meeting in Washington and get back that night, otherwise I wasn't going to go to the meeting. So you get a few extra customers if you have uh, more departure times, but it turns out most of your extra customers you're cannibalizing from your other flights, because some people on the 8 o'clock or the noon flight say, ooh, 10 o'clock, that looks good to me. And, the, and so as that flight fills up, the other one's empty, and the load factor overall, meaning the fraction of seats that are full, goes down. Load factors in the 60s would be uh, between 50 and 60 percent. Today, they're what, eight, low 80 percent, I think. And uh, the result of that is you 
uh, seldom get to see, as I did every Monday morning and Friday evening, I always had six seats to myself. Because uh, I'd say I had the whole row. I didn't have the, just the three on my side. There were three more on the other side uh, the way I had. Because at that time, there were about 10 to 12 flights of 737s a day between Nashville and Washington, D.C. Today, there's about eight flights, and they're in planes that only hold 60 people. Uh, both cities are larger today, uh, and, uh, and yet the number of seats flying back is probably under half of what it used to be. So what happens then, costs go up again. Then they get together, raise prices again. Costs go up again. And in the Douglas Miller book, what they, they have a nice theoretical model that shows uh, you reach an equilibrium that is very, very high cost and high service, where service quality is lots of empty seats. Like it, nobody spilled, no kid spills orange juice on me or anything like that, because there's nobody any, uh, anywhere uh, near me. I, I would like to have that. It's sort of like having a private airplane. It's getting closer to that anyway. Uh, and that's high quality service. But then what they do is they look, they try to figure out, well, how much would the passengers really be willing to pay for this uh, more convenient departure time? And to simplify the thing, they uh, look at how much time people save, and they look at the value of their time in terms of their earnings, uh, and try to price that out. And it's way less than the extra costs that have been uh, uh, generated by this competition, this, uh, this non-price competition between the <coughs> firms. Uh, and then what really happened in 1975, Senator Ted Kennedy uh, needed uh, uh, a chief of staff for his office. And where does Senator Kennedy always get the chief of staff? Well, from the Harvard faculty. And so a young law professor named Stephen Breyer uh, joined him for a year. Somewhere, somebody told Kennedy either about one of those two books about California or just uh, uh, an anecdote uh, about these pictures on the right. The bottom picture is Kennedy's route to Logan uh, in order to then drive on to Hyannisport. The top picture is a flight that's about 30 miles shorter, I think, uh, but it's less than half the cost. And Kennedy, being a frugal person he, he is, uh, under severe uh, income constraints, that's sarcasm, uh, says, what's going on here? Why do I have to pay double what they have to pay in California? Uh, talks it over with Breyer. Breyer organizes these hearings uh, about why the senator has to pay twice as much. Uh, and it's based on these books looking at the airline industry inside the state of California. Just wholly intrastate, not regulated as long as you're intrastate. But they couldn't fly to Las Vegas, uh, for example, because they couldn't cross the state border. At the same time, in the Ford administration, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors was Alan Greenspan, who you've probably heard of. He went on to other things after this, such as the, uh, such as the Fed. Uh, and uh, he was very much into uh, free markets and letting free markets operate and had the staff, including myself, working uh, on these questions. It wasn't just airline deregulation. There was trucking deregulation. There was natural gas, not the pipelines, but gas deregulation, electric utility production, lots of things uh, that, that at one point we thought had to be regulated. We were looking at whether or not, with certain stipulations and regulations, could be less regulated. And so the top is just my little story about the lobster sandwiches there. Uh, the second one, uh, uh, Carter comes into office in 1977. Kennedy gets his ear. Uh, uh, and uh, Carter appoints an economist, uh, Alfred Kahn from Cornell, still alive, uh, who had written a, the treatise on economic regulation uh, to be the chair of the CAB. He hired, uh, uh, or not hired, he suggested uh, Elizabeth Bailey's name, and Carter appointed Bailey as the commissioner. She wrote the chapter. So she was there when they did this. And uh, the staff, the head of the staff, was uh, Levine, the guy who had written one of those two books about California, and another uh, young economist, Darius Gaskins, who had graduated from Michigan uh, only a few years before. And the CAB sat around and figured out how can we deregulate. Everybody's against it. The passengers from Chattanooga and Charleston, West Virginia, are afraid that if we deregulate, 
the airlines won't fly into Chattanooga and Charleston, West Virginia, the latter being very important because Senator Byrd was already powerful at that time, uh, let alone 35 years later. And he wanted to make sure there were lots of flights into Charleston so he could get home on the weekends. And you're afraid that uh, when, when every route has to stand on its own grounds and there's not subsidies to cross-subsidize, that the airlines would say, let's cut this route if it doesn't have enough passengers uh, to, uh, uh, to sustain it. So you had passengers uh, worried, and of course they complained to their congressmen. Uh, flight attendants were worried because when we keep adding more flights, remember this, we need, car, uh, we need a crew, and that includes flight attendants, and shifts the demand for flight attendants to the right, increases the wages of flight attendants and jobs. The flight attendants threatened to shut down the whole airline industry. And the only thing we've had that has actually done that has been the World Trade Center uh, uh, crashes that shut it down for about five days. And you know people driving all over the country, uh, lots more deaths on the highway because of that. They never seem to get counted in with the, with the World Trade Center deaths, but lots of people drove across the country because they couldn't get home on an airline. And it's much safer on an airline than even then. Uh, than driving. Uh, who else? Uh, oh, the airlines were, didn't like this. Delta in particular was making money. They, were, they, they figured out the regulation system probably better than the others, and they were adamantly opposed to this because uh, if uh, they made less money, the stock prices would go down. The executives have a lot of options, uh, uh, stock options. They didn't like that idea. Uh, and so eventually, they came up with the idea of deregulating cargo. As an experiment, seven of the 12 case studies in the book involve experiments in one way or another. And I made a presentation, a group of us did a presentation to Congress, and I had to take out the line, uh, which I had somewhere in the slides, even a Congress, congressional representative can understand a simple experiment. There's a control group and a treatment group, and you look at the different outcomes. And if indeed you've got a truly randomized assignment, and there's a lot of issues on whether you can ever truly do that, but if you have a true random assignment, you can detect uh, some of the, uh, some of the what, you, what we by theory think is the causes of, of the treatment. Well, here they decided to experiment with cargo carriers because among other things, we had no passengers, no, sen no senator from West Virginia objecting. Uh, and we had no flight attendants to object that we're going to shut down the airline industry. And so they uh, uh, did deregulate cargo, and one of the results was the stock prices of FedEx and the other cargo, D DSL, DHL, D something L, uh, all went up a whole lot. When those went up, then some of the passenger airline executives took notice. They said, oh, I could handle that. And Delta was the one that switched its position in favor of deregulation uh, on the grounds that, hey, if it works for them, it could work for us, and our stock prices would go up, and I'd get wealthier, and that's what I'm, uh, I'm about. And so then the pressure to not do it for passenger airlines diminished, but it was still there. And so what they did uh, was, again, uh, uh, tried some experiments. They found some airports, Newark, Baltimore, Midway, San Jose, that were really underutilized, and this is because a lot of these cities had built another main airport in the 1960s. We're talking about O'Hare, San Francisco uh, International. Uh, New York really didn't. Their other two airports were there before. Uh, and Dulles uh, appeared along about that time. A lot of big airports were built in the 1960s, and we abandoned other ones, such as Hobby in Houston and Love, in, Love Field in Dallas. And so the idea was that well, these are airports that nobody is serving. And so if we start service here, there won't be, uh, this isn't direct competition with the legacy carriers. Uh, and so they started allowing competition into those uh, airports, entry into those airports. Does that look like a list of airports that one airline happens to use very intensively right now? That you may, where am I? I'm in Boston here. Uh, Southwest Airlines has uh, huge amounts of traffic through all of these uh, airports, and they were the one that, that, that started flying. There was a little condition, the Lloyd Benston uh, rule in Texas, the Southwest was not allowed to stop in a state that touched Texas. So they had to fly over Oklahoma and Louisiana and so on for a while. That, when did that end? 10 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that, that was finally repealed as well. And they also allowed price cutting 
not on regular tickets, the idea was, but on the empty seats. Well, there's lots of empty seats. There was a lot of empty seats, and that was the problem. There were, there were, there were a lot of empty seats. And uh, pretty soon, all hell broke loose, and we had competition. Uh, Southwest uh, starts expanding all over the place. And even today, there's a recent article, three, four, five years ago, about uh, the, the effect of Southwest uh, just as a threat of entry. If they are at one end of a possible route where they don't fly yet, but they already have, uh, have facilities at one end of the route, and so it will only cost them half as much to get in as if they had no facilities at either end, uh, the existing carriers cut their rates substantially. I think it's up there. On average, about 40%. Maybe one more quick one. And that's the one I want to do. You do. Uh, this is the most recent one, 19, uh, 2006. Uh, a field called behavioral econom economics has developed in the last 15, 20 years. Some departments are even starting a separate course in behavioral economics, but it can be worked into all courses. And what it's all about is trying to figure out what's going on when people don't seem to behave like the rational actor uh, that economists think uh, they are. When they do things differently, I'll give you one example. I prefer apples to oranges, oranges to bananas, and bananas to apples. About 10% of the population, if you do experiments, will tell you they have choices like that. What's the usual economist response? You idiot, don't you realize uh, this is inconsistent? This is intransitive. You can't prefer apples to oranges, oranges to bananas, and bananas to apples. And I just sit there and say, but I do. You know, <laughs> uh, the, the kind of the old approach of economists is to tell people they're stupid and they need to sh shape up and do it right. Uh, but that's not our job. Our job is, trying to, is to try to explain their behavior. Uh, this, incidentally, if people have preferences like that, go back to your indifference curves and uh, it causes some substantial problems, actually. <laughs> the whole thing collapses. Uh, there. So that's just one example. Uh, so behavioral economists tend to you know, observe things that you can't figure out. The January effect in the stock market. If the stock market always goes up in January, uh, why uh, don't uh, Professor Morrison and I buy as much stock as we can in late December, uh, watch it go up in January and sell at the end of January? If we do that, then it will go up in December, and it can't go up as much more in January if we bought enough in December. But yet this occurs year after year after year after year. This is sort of like my wife thinks she can get to work in 20 minutes. She's never gotten to work in 20 minutes yet. But every day I say, how long will it take you? 20 minutes, yeah. So what's, what's wrong here? Uh, it, you know, it's a cognitive dissonance. So here's the problem. Um, two important facts. And uh, a lot of people uh, across the river at uh, Harvard were doing a lot of the work on this. David Lapsom and the Bridget Madrian uh, were doing a lot of work on savings rates. And until late 2008, the U.S. savings rate was negative. People were actually spending more than their incomes. And we were draining down savings accounts. Uh, the, Social Security it was some kind of, quote, forced savings uh, in, in uh, one sense, but private savings rates were negative. They now flipped uh, substantially uh, positive. So there's always some good effect of a financial crisis and a market meltdown. Uh, scare the daylights out of people uh, is what, what might be the positive effect. So savings rates are very low. If you look at, are people saving enough? I mean, we're all for getting rid of, uh, of uh, paternalism and defined benefit uh, uh, um, pension plans where when you retire, you got to fix them out from your firm or your state if you're a state employee, if your firm is still there uh, to pay those fixed benefits. There's some risk to that. But get rid of that and we'll have private accounts. This has been the Social Security argument, have private accounts. Uh, companies have switched uh, roughly uh, I guess it used to be about 70% were defined benefit, and uh, now it's flip-flopped, so it's about the exact opposite. Most of them are defined contributions, so that uh, at a lot of private universities, uh, uh, the employees are in something called TIAA-CREF, the largest private pension in the world, 
because it has many, 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 many different universities all lumped together. Uh, and uh, I just retired two weeks ago. So I've been paying in for 38 years. And I walk away, and I actually don't care if my university now goes bankrupt. Whereas if you work for Ford, as the husband of one of the people that works for me at the American Economic Association does, uh, he's got a defined benefit uh, for the rest of his life. And he cares very much whether Ford uh, is a viable company or is not a uh, viable company. So when you switch to having your own private savings, if you don't save enough, uh, you're going to be short uh, when you're old. What are we going to do uh, with you? Well, we might just let you die in the gutter. That's one possibility. Another possibility, and I'm sure this is it, is I'm going to have to pay for you. Uh, surely it'll be me one way or another. Uh, I've saved a lot uh, uh, by not going on vacations and so on. And you and your families went on vacations, and then when you get old, you're broke, and then you're going to turn to me uh, to bail you out. Hmm, I don't like that, and that's one reason I might want to kind of have some forced savings uh, by you uh, to protect myself. Now this, I've actually just described my family. I have four adult kids, or at least they're large kids. Uh, and uh, I sometimes think that uh, they think I'm the government, uh, and I'm going to be there to bail them out. And occasionally, here's a good example, occasionally, uh, well, one of them right now is, how do we put it, between jobs, I think she says, is the language. I said, what about your health insurance? Well, I'm only in my early 30s. I'm OK. I said, no, I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about me. <laughs> because if you end up having to have a liver transplant next week with no insurance, I, I have a good idea where, indeed, the money is going to come from. And I don't want to be in the insurance business. You know, there are, there are externalities uh, here. Or could we actually just look at her on the table and say, well, that was your dumb choice, Karen. Uh, you shouldn't have done that. I don't think we actually could do that. Yeah. So we're short on savings. And then uh, all the uh, savings plans are turning to ones that seem to behave like the rational actor uh, that economists think uh, they are. When they do things differently, I'll give you one example. I prefer apples to oranges, oranges to bananas, and bananas to apples. About 10% of the population, if you do experiments, will tell you they have choices like that. What's the usual economist's response? You idiot, don't you realize uh, this is inconsistent? This is intransitive. You can't prefer apples to oranges, oranges to bananas, and bananas to apples. And I just sit there and say, but I do. You know, <laughs> uh, the, the kind of the old approach of economists is to tell people they're stupid and they need to sh shape up and do it right. Uh, but that's not our job. Our job is, trying to, is to try to explain their behavior. Uh, this, incidentally, if people have preferences like that, go back to your indifference curves and uh, it causes some substantial problems, actually. <laughs> the whole thing collapses. Uh, so that's just one example. Uh, so behavioral economists tend to you know, observe things that you can't figure out. The January effect in the stock market. If the stock market always goes up in January, uh, why uh, don't uh, Professor Morrison and I buy as much stock as we can in late December, uh, watch it go up in January and sell at the end of January. If we do that, then it will go up in December, and it can't go up as much more in January if we bought enough in December. But yet this occurs year after year after year after year. This is sort of like my wife thinks she can get to work in 20 minutes. She's never gotten to work in 20 minutes yet. But every day I say, how long will it take you? 20 minutes, yeah. So what's, what's wrong here? Uh, it, you know, it's a cognitive dissonance. So here's the problem. Um, two important facts. And uh, a lot of people uh, across the river at uh, Harvard were doing a lot of work on this. David Lapesom and the Bridget Madrian uh, were doing a lot of work on savings rates. And until late 2008, the US savings rate was negative. People were actually spending more than their incomes. And we were draining down savings accounts. Uh, the Social Security it was some kind of, quote, forced savings uh, in, in uh, one sense. But private savings rates were negative. They now flipped uh, substantially uh, positive. So there's always some good effect of a financial crisis and a market meltdown. Uh, scare the daylights out of people uh, is what, what might be the positive effect. So savings rates are very low. If you look at, are people saving enough? I mean, we're all for 
getting rid of, uh, of uh, paternalism and defined benefit pr uh, uh, um, pension plans where when you retire, you got a fixed amount from your firm or your state, if you're a state employee, if your firm is still there, uh, to pay those fixed benefits. There's some risk to that. But get rid of that and we'll have private accounts. This has been the Social Security argument, have private accounts. Uh, companies have switched uh, roughly, uh, I, I guess it used to be about 70% were defined benefit and uh, now it's flip-flopped so it's about the exact opposite. Most of them are defined contributions. So that uh, at a lot of private universities, uh, uh, the employees are in something called TIAA CREF, the largest private pension in the world because it has many, 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 many different universities all lumped together. Uh, and uh, I just retired two weeks ago, so I've been paying in for 38 years, and I walk away, and I actually don't care if my university now goes bankrupt. Whereas if you work for Ford, as the husband of one of the people that works for me at the American Economic Association does, uh, he's got a defined benefit uh, for the rest of his life, and he cares very much whether Ford uh, is a viable company or is not a uh, viable company. So when you switch to having your own private savings, if you don't save enough, uh, you're going to be short uh, when you're old. What are we going to do uh, with you? Well, we might just let you die in the gutter. That's one possibility. Another possibility, and I'm sure this is it, is I'm going to have to pay for you. Uh, surely it'll be me one way or another. Uh, I've saved a lot uh, uh, by not going on vacations and so on. And you and your families went on vacations, and then when you get old, you're broke, and then you're going to turn to me. Uh, to bail you out. Hmm, I don't like that, and that's one reason I might want to kind of have some forced savings by, by you uh, to protect myself. Now this, I've actually just described my family. I have four adult kids, or at least they're large kids, uh, and uh, I sometimes think that uh, they think I'm the government, uh, and I'm going to be there to bail them out. And occasionally, here's a good example, occasionally, uh, well one of them right now is, how do we put it, between jobs, I think she says is the language. I said, what about your health insurance? Well, I'm only in my early 30s. I'm OK. I said, no, I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about me. <laughs> because if you end up having to have a liver transplant next week with no insurance, I, I have a good idea where, indeed, the money is going to come from. And I don't want to be in the insurance business. You know, there are, there are externalities uh, here. Or could we actually just look at her on the table and say, well, that was your dumb choice, Karen. Uh, you shouldn't have done that. I don't think we actually could do that. Yeah. So we're short on savings. And then uh, all the uh, savings plans are turning to ones that you're going to have to get. You have a form. And it will say, or used to say, uh, would you, it might say something like, the, uh, let's see, Vanderbilt says, you, you must put 5% into your uh, uh, basically a 401k, your private uh, uh, pension plan, and the university will match that. And then there's a question, would you like to put another 5% in? And this does have the benefit of deferring taxes on that. Although if the tax rates are higher when you take it out, it's not quite as much of a benefit as it might appear to begin with. And a lot of young people say, well, wait a minute, then I'll be short on beer money on Friday night. No, I don't want to put anything in there. Well, it turns out, when you ask people this question, five, six, seven, eight years ago, about 30% would check the box, yes, and this 30% number is a very rough average over lots of studies, about 30% would say, yes, I want to put the extra amount in. <clears throat> what the behavioral economist noted was that if you switch the question and said, unless you check this box, uh, we will be putting the extra amount in, well, what, what would an economist think would happen? Switch this, say, unless you check this box, or we're going to force you, or we're going to automatically put another 5% of your pay into your 401k. Economists say, who cares which way the question is phrased? Anybody can read a question, decide what they want to do, and they'll do the same thing. However, in reality, when you switch the question, 30% check the box. In fact, the rule is, doesn't matter what the question is, 30% check the box. <laughs> they don't read the question. So that if you flip the question, you get 70% signing up for the 401k, for the extra savings. 
which Madri and Leibson et al. have demonstrated we really could use because we're not even breaking even at the time this work was done. So they did a lot of, again, experiments with individual firms. I have a picture of one. Uh, I've told you about uh, that stuff. Uh, there's one of the, the firms. Now this, it doesn't go from 30 to 70. The 30 to 70 is a rough average of tons and tons of these. Uh, this one, the gray line at the bottom, is the fraction that we're signing up <coughs> before uh, they flip the question. So it's what, 70% maybe on average? And then when they flip the question, it's almost 100% we're signing up at that particular company. Others might have gone from 20 to 50% or something like this. My 30 and 70, it seems like everything in this area is 30 and 70. Uh, the, my 30 and 70 comes uh, from uh, averaging them. How did this get uh, implemented and what happened? Uh, you know, the airlines was putting economists into the decision-making positions. That's not how this worked. Uh, a man named Peter Orzog, who you might have heard of, he just stepped down as the head of OMB, uh, the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, and he got a lot more press than most economists because his love life got to be of interest to people and not very many economists uh, uh, have a very exciting love life uh, that uh, interests these entertainment tonight type shows and so on. Uh, Peter went around to congressional representatives one by one and tried to talk them into changing the default on the 401ks. The resistance he got was if we flip this and people uh, uh, don't check the box, then they will kind of automatically be enrolled. That's paternalism. And his argument was, and if we don't flip it, and then people don't check the box, that's paternalism. It's just a paternalism with a different outcome because there's no kind of pure way to do this. You've got to have the question one way or the other way. Uh, and it all depends on what you think is sort of the pure, unadulterated outcome. Eventually, he uh, convinced uh, enough of them uh, that, uh, that there's no, neither way uh, has anything over the other way. And in 2006, we passed the, uh, uh, what is it called, Pension Protection Act or something like that. It has a lot of different uh, clauses in it uh, that led to flipping the question. Now, the first paragraph is about something else a little different. Another part of that act that I don't really need to get into uh, right now. And I think that's the end of this one. Yeah. You've seen him before? Other pictures there. See? Volcker. There he is. Uh, Bernanke. There's one, other, there's one in monetary policy as well. There's uh, nine more of these. I talked about three of them. I think I used up all and maybe some more than all of my time. And so uh, I'll stop and I'd be glad to add, answer any questions. The main theme, or one of the main themes is political scientists, anthropologists that actually are in the White House uh, daily uh, briefing the president. And so we get quite an opportunity to get our uh, ideas heard. Oops, going the wrong way. Thank you. Sorry, I was going the wrong way. I was going to go back to the list of the. Whoa. Lucky I didn't do them all. There. I have a Council of Economic Advisors question from your own experience there and others that you've heard about. I've, I've heard it said that most what they do is keep bad things. Yes, I stopped the Harlingen World War I Airplane Museum <laughs> in Harlingen, Texas. That paid my entire salary. Yes, that, there, that, that probably is true. Uh, yes, but, but it's, we're a pretty cynical bunch. Uh, there, there is some positive, there's a positive side to this as well. The welfare to work stuff, uh, which is another, actually two of these are on welfare to work. One of them is on the earned income tax credit that came out of the negative income tax idea that's in Milton Friedman's 1962 book, Capitalism and Freedom, four of these the idea is in capitalism and freedom, that book in 1962. Uh, that came out of the Council of Economic Advisors because Becky Blank was the driving force behind it and she was on the council uh, at the time. And that was a positive thing. Again, 
it, 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 what you have to do is find a, a win for both parties, both the Democrats and Republicans. And so welfare to work, the win for the Republicans was, ah, get these lazy welfare queens working again. Incentives, and uh, uh, we're going to create incentives for people to get off their duff and get out there and work. Well, what was the incentive for the Democrats? They were on board too, big time. Particularly the governors of states. Most of the welfare money is raised at the state level. So what would welfare to work do, or what has it done? I actually have a slide here that shows it. It's reduced the total amount of welfare payments because many of the people, and they were mostly women, and indeed the research shows that, uh, this is a little embarrassing, uh, that women actually do respond to incentives, men don't. They're just oblivious to the incentives. They just go out drinking all the time anyway. Uh, women actually look at what's going on and will react uh, to, to, the, uh, uh, to the incentives. Uh, and the, the, the incentive for the Democrats was uh, when they did experiments, again, this was experiments. Different states did it different ways. And they kind of looked at, hey, what happened in Nebraska versus Kansas? Well, they looked at where most more money was saved. And governors, democratic governors of states like that idea. Save money, then I can use more money to buy votes. I don't, I don't pay people directly with cash. I run the subway one more stop to their area, say here's what you got from me, vote for me. Uh, I provide other types of services uh, uh, that, that my constituents uh, would like. And so the Democrats liked it like that as well. And most of these you'll find Somehow, you got uh, something for both parties. Uh, uh, and that may be why some of our current disputes seem irreconcilable, because we can't figure out uh, a benefit for both of the parties. I got a question. I'm an international student. Sometimes I don't think our is like uh, American people. You got a negative on saving, but how so? I mean, you know, if you are uh, you don't saving your uh, in your old time, you will be miserable. I mean, like you don't have income or something like that. So why? Well, one difference. Uh, where are you from? China. China. Uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. One difference is in, in this country. Uh, my kids, I am sure, have no notion that they're going to take care of me in my old age. Okay. They're going to dump me. <laughs> okay. Uh, that even, to some degree, occurred with, with my generation and even the one before. Once we started Social Security, there's several reasons. One, enormous mobility in this yeah. country. So you don't live close to your parents. Uh, secondly, there are some, you know, I paid into Social Security and that money wasn't put in Al Gore's lockbox, there isn't one, uh, but rather went directly to my grandparents. Uh, and so because I was paid into that, I was thinking, well, I don't have to pay separately a second time for that. So I, that, that's kind of part of my uh, uh, share. So there's much less of an expectation uh, that kids will take care of their uh, parents. And that's why I am more interested uh, also in my own kids having uh, sufficient saving. It's a great trick, incidentally, is I set up a Roth IRA for all of them. That's after-tax income. I pay into it. I, the prospectus is this thick. They looked at it and said, oh my god, I'm not reading that. So I said, that's simple. You can't take it out until you're 59 and a half. That's not entirely true, but I didn't tell them that. And it's their fault they didn't read the prospectus. <laughs> uh, so they think, you know, actually when they first got it, I remember the two oldest were looking at this as, what is this? I gave it to, as a Christmas present, $5,000 into a Roth IRA. And the one says, what is this? Yeah, yeah, God. And the other one then says, oh, no, no, Ann, this is great. What? With this, we don't have to save anything. Now, ah! <laughs> that was not what I intended. However, they were saving so little that it didn't much matter if they cut back on what they were saving uh, when I put that into their Roth IRA. Uh, uh, we are concerned with our kids and with our parents having enough because there's less of a, uh, I think, a, a notion of, of family obligations than there was in this country uh, 100 years ago. I grew up on a family farm that had nine generations. And up until about the seventh, that's exactly what was going on. Uh, the old people were you know, kept on the farm and, and taken care of by the, uh, the next generation. 
Yes, sir. I keep hearing about the depletion of funds within the Social Security system. Um, do you want to comment on that? that would be well, it doesn't really have funds. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's an actuarial uh, uh, calculation. Um, there's no, there is no lockbox and a pile of funds there. There is an issue uh, of, uh, of whether or not the amount coming in under FICA taxes is enough to cover the Social Security payments, and that, that's what turns negative in 2017, right? I think, I think that is the thing that turns negative. However, so what's happening now when more money is coming in than that? Well, we're using it to buy mortars for uh, Afghanistan. So what's going to happen in 2019? Uh, we're going to have to take some money that's coming in some other way uh, with the federal gasoline tax or something and use that to pay Social Security. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of an arbitrary uh, break-even point uh, there uh, uh, because there's, it's, the trade-off is there already and it's going to be there even after uh, that point. I think the fear is uh, that uh, my kids, and they've assured me that this is true, are going to say at one point, no, I'm not paying any more in for you. You know, and since we've already left the culture of they're going to take care of me in my old age, and now they aren't even going to pay into the Social Security to take care of me. That's what I did for two generations. Uh, what am I going to do? I better save <laughs> here. Uh, however, lots of people don't. I mean, that's, that was the problem. Many, many people don't. And then we're thinking, what are they going to do? And if we could be as hard-headed and hard-hearted to say, that's your problem if you don't save. And if you gotta live in, you're going to be homeless and live in a tent, tough. I don't think we can do that. I don't think we will do that. And that's where, I, uh, that's where a lot of people, I guess like me, who save a lot, say, hang on, I'm saving a whole lot to take care of myself. And then somebody's going to say, oh, and you got to take care of the other people too. Well, I didn't go on vacations to the Caribbean while well, they did. Uh, this isn't fair. I was going to go on vacations to the Caribbean when I was retired, and now you're raising my taxes when I'm retired to pay for these other people who didn't save anything. I mean, that's that's main, the main argument for forced savings, if you will, for Social Security, uh, is that other people will be irresponsible and, 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 big and, and we won't be hard-hearted enough to just say tough luck. You know, and I don't want us to be hard-hearted enough to say tough luck. Uh, but then I back up and say, I want to make sure that Professor Morrison's putting a lot of money in his 401k so that I'm not uh, uh, supporting his family. <laughs> yes. Time for one more question. But do government have the right to force citizens to save? I mean, uh, it's like whether I want to save is my choice, right? But now Americans, it's like have social security uh, program and the health insurance program that force everybody have to save. Yeah, well, Social Security is a good example of something we do force on most people, not Congress. <laughs> they opt out of the system. Uh, and there's some others. I guess all government employees are not in the uh, uh, Social Security system. Well, that's uh, not true. Is, no? Government employees pay into SS under FERS. An, an alternative. No, they, no. Uh, they have to. FERS was initiated in 1985, and they oh. went to the CSRS. All government employees now, hired after 1985, have to pay Social Security. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I worked for the government in 76, a <laughs> long time ago. They went to the uh, Civil Service Retirement System, the Federal Employment yeah. Retirement System. So they all pay SS, and after, I think, 40 quarters, uh, they can collect. That's the, yeah, that's the same as uh, in the private sector. Uh, well, the, the problem with not forcing people is the same as the insurance problem. Of, uh, uh, I, I would be in favor of not forcing people to have insurance. As long as when they show up at the emergency room, you just say, no. Uh, and I'm actually, that one I'm pretty serious on, uh, unless it's life-threatening. Suppose it's not life-threatening. The, the emergency room should be able to say no. Okay? Because you, what's happening there, my son's in this category right now. Oh, I'm healthy. So yeah, until you get hit on your bicycle by a truck in Chicago or you're driving around an old place. Uh, and, and then who's going to take care of you? Oh, I just go to the emergency room. Well, no, they're going to they're going to dun me first. Uh, although he's over 21, and so I'm not his legal guardian anymore. So I'm going to tell him declare bankruptcy, okay? Uh, and then uh, all the rest of you that go to that hospital are going to pay uh, for it. So, if, but if they could tell him, nope, all you have is a broken leg. We're not taking you. 
uh, it's not life-threatening, then, uh, then, then there would be more of an incentive for people to worry about themselves. But right now, they can game the system and say they can have their cake and eat it too. Namely, they can have the protection of the hospital that they know must take them, and they can have the money for beer on Friday night. And that describes him pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the problem is there's external effects on other people. That's the catch. Uh, and if you could prevent that, well, then, you know, shouldn't tell people what to do. But in the same way that, why should we tell people they can't drive drunk? That's an infringement just as much as telling them they have to buy insurance. Or way back when I was uh, your age, on uh, the first marriage, I had a brother-in-law who drove into Nashville, where I live, with a car with no brakes. He downshifted and had an emergency break. And I was just furious with him. And I remember he just looked at me and said, what's the matter? You don't believe in freedom and liberty? <laughs> I have the freedom and liberty to drive my car any way I want to. Yeah. Uh, he later fell off a building, a construction job. He's still alive, but uh, not functioning very well. Uh, I didn't feel very sorry for him because he had this kind of attitude uh, all the time. Uh, you know, if if there are ex potential external effects, you know, then maybe we, you have an interest in other people's behavior. Now, we do have to evaluate whether there are true external effects. And a lot of times people make them up, uh, too, uh, to try to get uh, be uh, benefits for themselves. I guess that's the end. Thank you very much.